Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar in the CERTUP and ESTCP webinar series. My name is Rula Deeb. I'm a senior principal at Geosyntec Consultants in Oakland, California, and the coordinator of the webinar series on behalf of CERTUP and ESTCP. I'll be facilitating today's call. The webinar will consist of a brief overview of CERTUP and ESTCP by Mr. Tim Tetro followed by a list of upcoming webinars in the series. After Tim's opening remarks, we will transition to the technical portion of the webinar. Today's event focuses on Department of Defense research efforts on coupling geothermal um, energy storage, uh, geothermal heat pumps with underground seasonal thermal energy storage. Mr. Charles Hammack will be the only presenter today but we'll pause halfway through his presentation to entertain questions from the audience. We will conclude the webinar with a second question and answer session. Today's broadcast will be listen only. You may submit questions by using the chat box on the left-hand portion of your screen. You do not need to wait until the Q&A period to submit your questions. In fact, we do encourage you to submit questions well in advance of the Q&A session. On this slide, we have provided you with a few suggestions in case you experience difficulties with the broadcast audio. Typically, any delay will be fixed if you refresh your screen or call into the conference line. However, if you continue to have problems, please submit a comment using the chat box in the left uh, corner of your screen. With that, I would like to introduce Tim, who is the third up and who is the ESCCP program manager for energy and water. Before joining uh, ESCCP, Tim worked at the National Renewable Energy Lab, where he focused his work on research efficient, uh, energy efficient, efficiency and renewable energy project development for the federal sector. With that, I turn it over to you, Tim. Thank you, Rula, and welcome everybody to today's uh, CERTIP and ESTCP webinar. Uh, I have a few slides to go over to give an overview of the program, and then I'll hand it back uh, to get started. CERTIP is the Strategic Environmental Research and Development Program. It was established in 1991 by Congress as a partnership between DOD, the Department of Energy, and the EPA. CERTIP's mission is to identify and address high-priority environmental science and technology opportunities that focus on DOD requirements. CERTIP funds both fundamental research as well as advanced technology development that ultimately impacts real-world environmental management. ESTCP is the Environmental Security Technology Certification Program in which we demonstrate innovative environmental and energy technologies. These investments capitalize on past investments under CERTIP or other research programs and are designed to transition technologies out of the lab and into the field. Especially important in all ESTCP demonstrations is the ultimate transition to impl implementation and regulatory acceptance. CERTIP and ESTCP are complementary programs with much of CERTIP research occurring at the lab and pilot scale with occasional field efforts while ESTCP demonstrations are primarily at the pilot and field scale, although occasionally supporting lab efforts are conducted. There are four program areas in CERTIP and five in ESTCP. The Energy and Water program area is only in ESTCP, while the other four, Environmental Restoration, Munitions Response, Resource Conservation and Res Resiliency, and Weapon Systems and Platforms are CERTIP and ESTCP programs managed jointly by a designated program manager. Our webinar today is focused on research and demonstrations that were conducted under the Energy and Water Program area. Energy and Water has essentially three main areas of research, smart and secure installation energy management, efficient integrated buildings and components, and distributed generation. Our webinar series highlights research and demonstration efforts from each of the five program areas. As you can see, upcoming webinars We'll cover a broad range of topics, including future vulnerabilities to Alaskan ecosystems and tools for permafrost assessment, 
the management of energetic and propellant material re releases on testing and training ranges, ranges, and research and development needs for the management of DOD's PFAS uh, contaminated sites. The next Energy and Water webinar will be conducted on September 21 and will focus on building envelope technologies. This webinar, webinar will feature two speakers, Dr. Ralph Mulhausen from Argonne National Lab and Mr. Curtis Harrington from Western Cooling Efficiency Center at the University of California, Davis. You can find more about upcoming webinars at this link. Registration is now live for webinars through the end of the summer. I would like to remind you that a copy of the presentation of today's session can be downloaded for, from our webinar page. And we would appreciate if you could take uh, a few moments to complete a survey that will pop up at, on your screen at the end of the webinar. And I am pleased to announce today that uh, for the first time since 2011, the CERTIP ESTC PPIT Symposium will be held this coming November in Washington, D.C. The three-day event will showcase the latest technologies that enhance DOD's mission through improved environmental and energy performance. Registration information is available on our website. And uh, with that, I will hold it hand it back to Rula, and I hope you enjoy the webinar. Thank you so much, Tim. It is now my pleasure to introduce uh, Mr. Chuck Hammack, who is a principal founder and mechanical engineer with Andrews Hammack and & Powell, Inc., a consulting engineering firm established in Georgia in 1988. Mr. Hammack's career began in 1980 and has been devoted to the design of HVAC systems for the built environment. Mr. Hammack is a graduate of Auburn University in Alabama, where he earned his Bachelor's of Mechanical Engineering in 83. He is a licensed professional engineer in multiple states and holds the LEED BDNC credential from the U.S. Green Building Council. Um, we're really happy to have you, Chuck, and I turn it over to you now. Uh, Rula, thank you so much, and I'd like to welcome you all uh, to this presentation. Uh, we even have a few uh, international guests from Sweden and South Africa, and I'm uh, just glad you're all here, and I hope you find this uh, presentation helpful. So we're going to break this up into two parts. The first part covering roughly a third of the time, where we're just kind of going to give you an overview of uh, geothermal heat pumps and thermal energy storage. Uh, and then the second part, we'll, we'll, we'll dig deep into the, our demonstration project, what the results were, what our goals were, some unanticipated technologies, if we have time, that were uh, peripheral to the project, but were also very helpful, uh, and I want to cover those if we can, and then we'll talk about kind of some of the benefits that came out of this project, some future opportunities to kind of carry what we did even further, uh, give you the conclusions we reached, and then we'll open it up for a second uh, Q&A session after we finish that portion. So looking at thermal energy storage, uh, generally you can say that you could divide that into sensible storage, as in it makes sense. It is a change in temperature. You're storing thermal energy by either lowering or raising the temperature of some media, solid, liquid. Uh, if it changes phases, then that would be considered latent storage, latent meaning hidden. So it might be a change from a solid to a liquid or a liquid to a vapor, or you can do both. Uh, our project was strictly sensible, but uh, certainly it could have incorporated latent if we had chosen to. The thermal energy storage that we'll be discussing today is both diurnal, as in daily storage, uh, and seasonal storage, as in winter or summer. Uh, thermal energy storage can be one or both, as our, this project was both. Generally, if we're above ground, you just call it thermal energy storage, or sometimes TESS. Uh, underground, uh, it's considered UTES, or underground thermal energy storage, sometimes pronounced UTES. And since this was a military project, we will be bearing you in acronyms today. There's two, two different flavors of it. Uh, one is borehole thermal energy storage, so-called BETAS. That's what we did at Albany at a roughly a 400-ton scale. Or aquifer thermal energy storage, so-called ATIS. Uh, the ATIS system at Fort Benning involved a brigade headquarters roughly about uh, 35 tons. Other forms of uh, UTIS uh, are hybrid UTIS, meaning maybe you're doing it above ground and below ground. 
Uh, there's a project in Calgary. The only other known to us uh, BETIS system in North America in Calgary is a, is a warm storage BETIS. Uh, but they also have above-ground tanks, so they're doing short-term storage above-ground and uh, long-term storage underground, so that might be considered a hybrid UDIS system. In Europe, uh, they sometimes use pit storage, literally digging a pit, uh, dumping snow in the pit during the wintertime, insulating the top, maybe some plastic pipe down in the pit, and then circulating water through that to melt that uh, snow, in other words, a late in the phase change, and cooling buildings with it. Uh, you can do storage in abandoned mines. If you have abandoned mines that are flooded, uh, you could use the abandoned mines as a storage, uh, basically the cavern being a storage, and you pump water in and out of it. Uh, so there's all kind of exotic uh, alternate, alternatives, including energy piles, which are basically a structural pile that you're driving down to support a building, typically with plastic pipe embedded in that. But today we'll be uh, covering just uh, plain Jane, Betus, and Adis, uh, although not so plain in the United States since we really haven't done a lot of that here. Our demonstration was sensible only, as I mentioned, and it involved two projects. The Betus project was at the Marine Corps Logistics Base in Albany, Georgia. The Adis project at the Army's uh, Fort Benning, uh, right on the Georgia-Alabama um, border. And a little illustration. Uh, on the right there is an ADIS system, which I will get into more detail uh, a little later. But uh, the left uh, well in blue represents the cold well, the well on the right, a warm well. Uh, the BETA system at Albany involved a ground loop heat exchanger. Uh, and that's typically in the United States and most places uh, constructed of high density polyethylene pipe, so-called HDPE, that's grouted down into a borehole. Uh, the borehole uh, going down uh, anywhere, typically 150 to 600 feet. At Albany, it was uh, 210 feet deep and 306 boreholes that we drill there. But beta systems differ from the way pretty much every other closed loop system in the U.S. has been done so far in that the boreholes are arranged in concentric thermal zones. So as you'll see shortly, looking a bit like an archery target. We have an inner zone, an intermediate zone, and an outer zone. So these three concentric thermal zones give us the ability to do some things we can't do with typical boreholes on a typical U.S. system that are piped in parallel, and you can't differentiate between an inner and, or a middle or an exterior borehole. And so our boreholes are piped in series. Um, you get a little more pressure drop when you have to go through three boreholes uh, in series versus they're all being in parallel, but it does allow some thermal stratification opportunities. So beta systems uh, usually will always have boreholes piped in series. The system in Calgary where they're storing heat has actually got uh, six boreholes in series. We modeled that uh, for Albany, but in the end the pressure drop was too high and the modeling didn't show a big benefit. So we ended up, uh, the final design was a, a series of three boreholes. The other unique thing about a beta system is reversible water flow. Traditional geothermal heat pump systems, the water flows one way, uh, kind of in and out. Uh, we actually can reverse the flow, a little bit analogous to a heat pump where you reverse the refrigerant flow so that you have a hot coil outside and a cold coil inside when you're cooling and a hot coil inside and a cold coil outside. Uh, kind of doing the same thing there with here, but we can reverse the water flow. You'll see why that's important in a minute. Most uh, American designed systems are, are designed for what Europeans call direct use. We, we want to use the, the ground as a heat sink and a heat source, but we're not really optimizing it for storage. In fact, storage sometimes inadvertently becomes a problem because heat builds up at the core of the bore field and we can't get rid of it if you're a cooling dominated system. So uh, UDIS is different, or BDIS is different in that we are using the geology certainly for heating and cooling, but beyond that we are um, optimizing the design of the, the ground loops for storage purposes. And typically we're rejecting heat at night in, or in the winter time. Our, the whole time I'll be talking today, we're talking about a cooling dominated building in a cooling dominated location, Georgia. And uh, we, we really don't care about heat. We have plenty of heat. Uh, so we're, we're more concerned about cold, if you will. And I know there's no such thing as cold, but most people go up to the faucet and they have a hot and a cold and they know what that means. So we're going to be a little uh, thermodynamically unrigorous and we're going to talk about hot and cold. And so with all this extra heat, 
a traditional HVAC system is working very hard to reject that at peak times. Even if you're a hybrid geothermal system, meaning you might have a cooling tower, that cooling tower is running hard and evaporating a lot of water at peak conditions. Uh, Betus is the opposite. We're dumping the heat at night and in the wintertime. We're not running these uh, dry coolers or adiabatic dry coolers at peak periods. So uh, we're rejecting our heat at a different time period. So those are the fundamental differences uh, between between the uh, traditional system and a beta system. Uh, this illustration, I hope, is a little bit uh, helpful and uh, kind of gives you an idea of, of what we have here. So starting at this location, this main is, uh, in, the, in the case of discharging the betus, this is the supply main. So water is flowing here into the betus through this outer circular or circumferential header running around the perimeter of the bore field. And then the water flows from that header down through a series of three boreholes uh, in increasingly colder zones. And then the coldest water flows through another smaller circumferential header and back to the building. So what I just illustrated would be discharging of the betas, the warm water hitting the perimeter and being able to dissipate its heat to infinity, if you will, beyond the bore field. And then we're chilling the water three different times through these boreholes and colder water passing back to the building, nice cold water that the, uh, that the chiller can use for very high EERs or low KW per, tons, uh, per ton. In the winter time, uh, the building chills the water and our adiabatic dry coolers chill the water, so we reverse the flow. And at that point, cold water flows to the core and we chill the core, the most important part to us, and then back out through the same boreholes in a reverse flow, and the water is gathered up in the circumferential header and back to the building where it's warm and can heat the building and we can dump the heat. So that is kind of the key thing here. Uh, we've got thermal zones, reversible flow, and that is what separates um, a beta system from a traditional closed loop system. The ADA system uh, that was installed at Fort Benning differs from conventional uh, open loop geothermal in that every well is capable of extraction and injection. So each well uh, can pull water out of the ground or put water back down in the ground. And the flow of the water is reversible. And so we end up with dedicated warm wells and cold wells. So if we're passing the building through the water through the building in the summer, we're creating warm water. So that waste heat goes down into a warm well and is used as our winter heat source. Uh, conversely, in the wintertime, uh, we're running the water through the building, the warm water. The building extracts the, its own waste heat that we stored the previous summer uh, to heat the building. And then it creates waste cool or, or chills the water. And in the deep south here, obviously, we need some help. So we're running the adiabatic dry cooler to get it even colder. We put that cold water down into the cold wells, and that is our summer cooling source uh, later in the year. American, or, and I don't mean American, but just open loop geothermal systems in general are not reversible. So you pull the water out of the ground. It's a nice heat source, heat sink. You inject it where you hope you're hydrogeologically speaking downstream so that it doesn't short circuit back to the supply wells and you throw it away. You throw away the waste heat all summer. You throw away the waste cool all winter and you could kind of visualize you don't do these systems unless the groundwater velocities are low. Our, both our sites are typically below 15 feet per year of movement in the aquifer based on our measurements. But uh, if you did have movement, you'd kind of see this blue wave and red wave and blue wave and red wave heading downstream and you throw it away. That, that's the way uh, open loop geo uh, is typically designed when it's not ATIS. Uh, it works great because the water is much cooler or warmer than the air at the appropriate time, but uh, you don't capture the waste heat at all. A ATIS allows us to capture the waste heat and back flush the, the wells periodically. Inherently, really, inherently it, it is reversible. This is kind of an illustration. It's not perfect, but it's, it's close to what's going on here. So if you visualize up at the top, uh, we might have a pit, or you'll see in our design we have a pit and a, and a wellhead coming out of the ground. 
And as you travel down vertically down this well, it's constructed very much like a water well. In our case, uh, at Fort Benning, uh, we're just south of the so-called fall line. Uh, the fall line is literally where the Native Americans or later the Europeans travel upriver until they hit the falls, uh, the water falls. And so that is really kind of where the rock starts to head uh, downslope. Uh, underneath, the, in our case, the coastal plain. So the fall line in America uh, starts at about Manhattan and kind of runs down the I-95 corridor. Eventually, it kind of sweeps uh, westward, uh, Columbia, South Carolina, Augusta, Georgia, Macon, where I'm at uh, right now, and just north of the Albany Project, and eventually to Columbus, Georgia, where Fort Benning is, uh, running across the uh, Alabama and curving up the Mississippi Valley, uh, and then back down again where it eventually ends in Texas. So so in that coastal plain area, we got a lot of agriculture, we got a lot of water, and uh, it's a good opportunity for ATIS. So in our case, if you look at the yellow uh, highlighted area there on the well, on the right corner, that is our aquifer. We have bedrock at a, a granite basically at 400 feet. That's the bottom of our tank. The confining clay layer is the, the middle brown layer you see there, and it is truly a confining layer. We pumped water in the yellow sand and kind of the tan sand, and you pump water out of the bottom, the water above it does not move. So water is perched, if you will, a, sur a surficial aquifer sitting atop our, the aquifer we're using. We're in a, the Cretaceous aquifer there. This is not the Floridan. So this is a conventional well, and um, you know, just to give you a, a little details, if you've never seen a well, you surround the well with what's called gravel pack, which is basically an engineered sand to keep the sand and the formation from coming in. You pull water through these slots, the water goes up into a pump, and then the pump discharges the water out if we're in the supply mode. If we're in the injection mode, the water comes back down that same well, travels down through here, hits a check valve at the pump discharge and cannot backflow into the pump. There's an injection valve I'll show you a close-up on earlier Earlier, uh, later, it opens up, lets the water into the well, and the water flows back into the formation basically by gravity. So that is the fundamental difference between a, a, a traditional water well or a geothermal well in that our wells can function both as, um, both as supply wells and um, injection wells. So if you look to the left here, this is another important feature. How did we know we had a confining clay layer? We ran a gamma radiation probe down the, uh, down the well. Uh, clay naturally has um, much more uh, gamma radiation than the sand, and we had a big spike right there. Sure enough, we had about a 15-foot layer of ancient clay there that serves as a essentially a watertight top to our tank. It's not necessary that you have those, but uh, it, it, uh, it can be helpful because you can keep all surface contaminants and, and things out of the aquifer. The other fundamental technology that was critical to this project is a geothermal heat pump. Um, regrettably, my industry of mechanical engineering, uh, we come up with a lot of different names for the same thing. Uh, some people love ground source heat pump. I, I think that's great. We certainly use the ground, but as described here, we sometimes use the aquifer. Uh, so I like the word geothermal. Uh, I, that's what we use throughout this presentation, but it's, it's uh, essentially interchangeable with ground source uh, heating and cooling or ground source heat pumps. Uh, another term is geo exchange. Uh, that, that's confusing to me. I know what the stock exchange is. Uh, uh, geo exchange, I don't know if we're running around swapping dirt, but um, I don't like geo exchange, but it's a very popular term also. Some people also refer to it as earth coupling uh, heating and cooling systems. This is not to be confused with geothermal systems that are used for electricity production. We are not making electrons directly. We are using less electrons, but we are not uh, making electrons. So some people call that big G geothermal. Some call it hot rock geothermal. Some people call it deep geothermal. But the technology we're discussing today is not injecting water down into the hot rocks and making steam for, for heating or, or electrical production. Uh, because it's a heat pump, by definition, it involves a compressor, uh, although in reality, as uh, you'll find out later on under uh, direct ATIS that we'll talk about, we're not actually running the compressor. But we will have to run a compressor in the wintertime no matter where we are in the world, so a heat pump always involves a compressor. And typically, and certainly in both of our projects, the architecture of this heat pump is either water to air or water to water, meaning ultimately we're taking heat in and out of the water and putting it in and out of the air or in and out of the water and into another 
a loop of water, maybe hot or chilled. There is another technology or pretty rarely used called DX geothermal, where you literally put copper pipe down into the ground, perhaps R410A, and that would be DX geothermal, direct expansion, where the refrigerant literally goes in and out of the ground. This is an illustration of a water source heat pump like you might find at Fort Benning or in my home. Uh, it is very analogous to uh, a traditional heat pump except that the compressor is on board. So in the illustration there, you'll see a coil with the blue arrow is the air, in this case in the heating mode, cold air hits the coil, it gets pulled into that centrifugal fan you see, warm air blows out. If you reverse the flow, then you can actually have the air coming in and being chilled and blowing out. Down in the bottom section there, in the lower left, you see refrigerant loop. So this is a traditional HVAC refrigeration loop. The arrow represents air blowing through a coil, the yellow cylinder, a compressor, the circle, a water to refrigerant heat exchanger, the little valve at the top, an expansion device, and that's the refrigerant loop. And then the heat pump has got connections that go to the ground loop, those three blue and red loops there shown in a horizontal fashion, perhaps done in a, um, a residential application. In our situation, those boreholes go vertically down into the ground and uh, sometimes you do some domestic water heating also so that would be a water to air heat pump at the uh, project in Albany we had water to water so in the upper right there is three modules we happen to have five modules each about a nominal 85 tons this is logcom three-star general uh, 800 employees, we don't want it to go down. We don't need but about three or four of those heat pumps at any given time, but we need to keep that facility up and running. We have water, hot water that connects to it. Uh, we did change the hot water from a ridiculous 160 degrees down to 110 so we could do free heat. We had chill water at the bottom that connected the source loop. The green goes to the uh, beat us. Uh, as you'll see in that illustration on the left, it is a heat recovery. So we can be heating, cooling, or simultaneous heating, cooling, and getting free heat. Another project, uh, another aspect of this, we covered most of this, but I do want to hit energy security and national disaster immunity. That is literally the beta system with a couple of wells, uh, a couple of monitoring wells in the foreground. In the background is the utter devastation of two tornadoes hitting MCLB and doing $100 million worth of damage uh, this year and not touching our system at all. We stayed fully intact uh, during that tornado event. So I'm going to stop here and we're going to have a short Q&A session and then we will head into part two. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Chuck, for a great first part of the presentation. We did receive a number of questions and I'll be posing them to you. Um, for starters, can you tell us why ground loop heat exchangers in the U.S. are not designed as a BTES? Uh, great question. I, I would say, uh, honestly, it's, it's uh, part ignorance and part tradition. Um, I've been doing geothermal systems for a while before I even learned that there was a, a BTIS architecture out there. And uh, I did a conference probably seven or eight years ago for the Air Force uh, where I presented traditional geothermal systems like we do them in the U.S. And then um, we uh, uh, at the end, I, I brought up a couple of these alternate, alternate architectures of Betus and Atus, and no one had ever heard of it. They suggested I perhaps uh, go after an ESTCP project. I said, what does that mean, ESTCP? And, I, and we were off to the races after we got selected to do this. So traditionally, uh, Americans have not done it this way. I hate to admit it. We're kind of stuck in a rut in doing it the way we've always done it. Our modeling software is not great for modeling it. You have to typically uh, use uh, more sophisticated programs, um, but I think mostly it's lack of knowledge. So hence the demonstration project, hence the attempt here to transfer this technology so others can use it throughout the U.S. because I do honestly believe it is a superior technology. Thank you, Chuck. Um, what are the savings for the ATIS and BTEX comp uh, BTEX compared to traditional cooling and heating? System. Can you quantify that? 
Yes, we'll be doing that in part two. Rough numbers, we cut the HVAC consumption by about 50% uh, compared to the baseline. Uh, we were at a disadvantage because we were putting uh, scroll compressors in on the BETIS project uh, in place of centrifugals, which obviously people know those are more efficient. So r roughly uh, cut the uh, energy consumption in half, but we'll get into those details in just a moment. Um, thank you. You made references to the U.S. versus outside the U.S. Can you tell us how many VITAS or ATAS systems are installed outside of the U.S.? Great question. Um, I would. Th there is no universal database that gives us rigorous numbers, but just uh, in discussions with colleagues uh, from around the world, best I can tell, there are at least dozens of beta systems. They may be connected typically to a combined heat and power cycle in a colder climate where you're normally throwing the heat away, so you, you make electricity when you need it, uh, say in the summer typically, and then you, you store that heat in the ground and use it. So there, there are, I would say, dozens of beta systems, um, and they can be solar thermal, they can be waste heat, they can be an air conditioning project like this. In terms of ATIS, I, I hate to admit it, but I, I, the, all I'm aware of that is active in the U.S. right now is uh, a cooling only, not not warm and cool like we'll be talking about today, but a, there's a cooling only ATA system at, at Stockton College, and then Fort Benning has the cooling and heating system. But just as an example, um, the Netherlands, which most of you know is kind of like New Orleans as a country, I, I'm kidding a bit, but the whole country is very uh, close to sea level or underneath it. The Dutch are masters at, um, at, at handling water. Uh, especially when they don't want their uh, country to be, uh, you know, underwater, uh, as, as parts of Holland are. So uh, the Netherlands, which is literally half the geographic area of Georgia, has 1,500 ATIS systems just by itself. So I would say worldwide a few thousand uh, ATIS systems and worldwide a few dozen beta systems. Uh, so... Great, thank you. Uh, a question from the NASA Research Center. Can the system be modeled using a lump parameter approach? Um, I suppose it could. Um, uh, the um, the software that uh, was utilized um, to, to, to model this um, was using kind of a, essentially uh, some, some finite elements um, and uh, the, the, the traditional uh, software that's available in the, uh, in the kind of in the, uh, if you will, in the geothermal heat pump world is uh, it doesn't have the capability of doing these thermal zones. And so um, uh, what, what we had to do uh, was to use a, an alternate piece of software that is um, uh, that is capable of, of, of you know modeling it a little bit better. So um, I, I guess in absolute terms, I, I, I'm not certain whether that is uh, whether that is possible. The, the software that we utilized was called Transis. If people are familiar with it, it's a very flexible software that gives us a, a lot of capability of, of doing custom modeling of, of systems like this. Great, thank you. Um, can you tell us whether traditional uh, ground loop designs uh, can be retrofitted using reversing valves to provide similar thermal storage benefits? Uh, that's a great question, and the answer is not really. <laughs> uh, the, the, uh, the problem is that your boreholes are typically piped in parallel. And so adding the reversing valves in and of itself is not going to help you. It, all that really will do is it will mean that the water flows. If, if, if a U-bend, think of a capital letter U as the plastic pipe down in the ground, if the U-bend uh, goes down to the bottom and the left leg is uh, you know, A and the right leg is B, water may be flowing down A and back up B, and now it's going to go down B and back up A. But that inherently doesn't change anything. Uh, you have to... Um, basically have the boreholes piped in series to begin with. Now, if you had a fairly rare series uh, borehole uh, system, you, 
you could get some benefit from reversing the flow, but we have not ever seen them arranged in concentric circles. When you do traditional geothermal heat pump, you're really trying, you're almost always imbalanced. Your, your cooling load doesn't match your heating load. So you're really just trying to dissipate heat in the end overall, or you're trying to extract more heat than you take out. So it's kind of what would be a finger design. If you look at your hands, you'd have these five different sub-mains heading out in an angle. So they're not tight and compact. So it wouldn't be easy to convert an, a, a traditional system to a BDIS unless you literally dug up the headers and repiped it. And that, in my mind, would be uh, problematic. Thank you so much. And uh, one last question before we transition to the second part of your talk. Can you tell us what you are using to model the components of both systems? Um, uh, we are, well, so to go back and answer your question, the, uh, the, um, the, the, the software we're using underground is Transus. You can also use Transus, uh, above ground, but, um, uh, part of the problem with that is that, um, is that if you do that, then, um, the uh, it's not a problem. I'm sorry. You can use uh, eQuest, uh, a program like eQuest, Train Trace, Carrier Hap. You model the inside of the building. You get the coil loads, and then once you've gotten the coil loads done, uh, you take those coil loads and then you put those into Transus and you model the underground uh, loads. So um, there is a uh, there is a uh, two different softwares. Uh, packages that are often run um, to to um, to allow you to model both above ground and below ground. With Transus, you can do both in one software package, uh, but typically, uh, especially if it's not a demonstration project like this, most people are not going to spend the money to to run the building load on Transus. Although it it, it certainly is done. Um, so, pretty much any good building energy modeling program can be used. To, and then you take the coil loads from there, and then you take it into something like Transus and model the underground portion. Great. And along these lines, really quickly, uh, we got a question from the University of Vermont. Which components are you modeling in Transus? Uh, great question. Uh, in, in Transus, we're – well, in Transus, we're modeling everything. We take the uh, – either Transus, eQuest, uh, train trace, carry hap. We take the building loads into Transus, and then Transus models everything else. We're modeling the pumps. We're modeling actually the compressor heat that we think will be added to the coil loads. Uh, we're using Transus to model the ground loop heat exchangers in these concentric zones. We're modeling the reversing valves. Um, we're modeling the dry coolers. So Transus, we actually model everything. It's just Transus wasn't necessarily the source of the coil loads that from the he heating and cooling system that we that we uh, applied to the Transus model. Thank you, Chuck. We did get additional questions. We'll save them to the final Q&A, but right now I'd like to please um, go ahead and transition to the second part of your presentation. Great. So um, part two here, we're going to talk about the research and demonstration work we did, dig down into some of the details, tell you what our goals were and what our results were, some of these complementary technologies I'm pretty excited about that we got to incorporate in there, uh, one of which the adiabatic dry coolers we've talked about a bit already. Um, the technology transfer successes. In, in the end, ESTCP is, is not about just demonstrating things, but to actually get them in the marketplace. So the technology transfer is already happening. We're, we're pretty excited about that. And, and then some future opportunities uh, for DOD, uh, universities, state government, commercial buildings, uh, industry, all of that. So, and then we'll kind of give you our conclusions and then we'll op open it back up for Q&A. So this is a schematic of the ATIS system. Uh, at Fort Benning, we literally have four wells, but two will suffice for this discussion. Unlike beta systems, when you get to big uh, jobs, closed-loop systems, you're talking hundreds of holes. If you're at uh, Stockton College, where they have you know, in excess of 10,000 holes doing a whole campus. So as you're doing heat conduction in and out of the formation, it takes a lot of boreholes, a lot of plastic pipe, a lot of grout. 
it's a very bulletproof system. It's closed loop. You don't have to worry about permitting really much. You don't have to worry about hydrogeolo hydrogeological considerations. But ATIS is neat because it allows you to do things very efficiently by taking liquid water in and out of the ground. So I'd like to start with the... Um, uh, this illustration here, and let's say that we've been running the air conditioning all summer. We've dumped heat down into the so-called warm well. So the, the kind of the orange band here represents the aquifer. We've heated the water up above the normal aquifer temperatures, maybe by 10 degrees or so, not a huge amount. We pass the warm water out and through a plate and frame heat exchanger. We don't want to run the groundwater through the building. Uh, groundwater can have minerals, all kind of issues. We also, in this particular case, are excited to be using anoxic water. There's no oxygen in the water. We want to keep it that way. We don't want dissolved gases to come out. We, we essentially have somewhat of a closed loop on the ground loop side. So we're not going to run that water through the building. We're just going to run it through an off-the-shelf plate and frame heat exchanger. The building then takes that heat, extracts it, and it's not illustrated here, but there are heat pumps inside the building that are pulling water out. I'm pulling heat out of the water all the time. So there's a heating demand in the building. The building is then cooling the water. Therefore, we're cooling the groundwater. So that's our waste cool that we're captured. But we're in the deep south, and we, we need a lot of cool. And we don't have a lot of winter. So then we're running. In this case, it illustrates a, 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 a it could be a cooling tower, dry cooler, adiabatic dry cooler. But we are further cooling the water with the dry cooler at night and in the wintertime. And the building might even be shut down. And we salivate when we see it's a rare 20 degree um, day in Georgia and so we might try to make you know some 38 degree water to inject down so that gets injected down into the coal well and it begins to dissipate out into the formation something in the magnitude of 5 to 10 million gallons per year for this building so that is our cold reservoir and we're building up our, our cold storage all winter to use the next uh, spring and, and then summer and fall uh, later on it warms up we can't use the economizers anymore. We pull the cold water out of the ground. Typically, the dry cooler is off. The building now dumps its heat into the water, and hence the creation of the warm well. So that's the basic uh, schematic of what one of these systems would look like. Physically, in the field, uh, what you see is uh, if you start on the right uh, there in the upper illustration, you see a pipe coming out of the ground. That's a six-inch pipe. There's uh, pneumatic or hydraulic tubing and power coming out the side of it, a uh, water level transducer coming out, a plate at the top. Um, th these wells typically will be pressurized they, to no more than 5 PSI, but typically gravity flow back into there. Underneath that white pipe, if you go down 250 feet roughly, you find the submersible pump, and then you find the very bottom of that well near the granite at 400 feet. The water then flows from that white uh, well underground into this pit. With the, you can see the lid open, and the illustration in the lower left is the water uh, in the bottom right corner coming from the well. It then, depending on whether you're going in or out, uh, passes through a series of pipes. Uh, that blue circle you see, you may can see, is the water meter where we're metering the injected volume of water. Uh, and we have temperature sensors and so forth, and then that water uh, then exits the pit, heads back to the building. So on the opposite wall of that pit is what you see in the lower right-hand corner. That is the uh, essentially the hydraulic system for the injection valve. The white and black tubing you see in the lower right-hand corner represents the hydraulic lines, which these happen to be a very strong 400 PSI rated plastic, but the, the who wants to get the hydraulic fluid uh, down in the aquifer and, and give uh, ESTCP a bad name? So we use distilled water as our hydraulic fluid. So the little gray reservoir cylinder is our, our hydraulic cylinder, if you will. Tiny little uh, beautifully made uh, small uh, Swiss pump in there that uh, pumps this hydraulic uh, fluid of distilled water down to the injection valve to modulate it open or closed. In the upper right-hand corner of that lower right picture is the actual controller where we're monitoring GPM, pressure, valve position, and we're putting the injection valve where it needs to be. We don't want to put unnecessary back pressure on the system, but we also do not want to um, 
uh, let the water ever be unpressurized. We don't want to create a vacuum. You don't want to squirt the water in at the top of the well and hope it somehow gets down to the bottom before it gets oxygenated. And then when it gets oxygenated, perhaps if there's iron in there, it precipitates out. And then the iron, the, there's bacteria there that love the uh, iron precipitate. And then you have biofouling. There's a lot of ways to do these systems wrong, but if you understand the hydrogeology and the water chemistry, they can be trouble-free. Some of these systems in the Netherlands have run 30 years without ever even uh, having to back flush the wells, and certainly uh, we did a lot of work to make sure we're not moving sand uh, in and out and that we're not doing anything with the, uh, the, the geochemistry of the water so that it's, uh, it's happy. We pull it out of there the way it came, we change it a few degrees, we put it back, and we live happily ever after. Uh, let me go back. I'm sorry. Uh, up on the wall there is the uh, the variable frequency drives. Uh, in, in the, on the left there, uh, there's some uh, electrical power on the back side of that uh, communication box. We have fiber optic cable uh, running the whole show. We don't want a lightning strike out here to get in the building and, and fry that. So we generally recommend fiber optic cable for all your comm uh, outside. So fiber optics tie this back to the building. And the VFD, uh, with a submersible pump, uh, different than traditional pumps like you're used to, the bearing on the bottom of the submersible pump, uh, to, for it to do its job, you, you need to uh, run the pump at at least 30 hertz. So we're typically modulating between 50% uh, and 100%. All right, this is the adiabatic dry cooler I mentioned. Uh, uh, as an American engineer, I really weren't familiar with these. You don't see a lot in America, but they're all over the world, and they're starting to catch on here. So not, not a lot to an adiabatic dry cooler, all this, although this particular one is pretty interesting. You basically have a V-bank coil here. This could be a, an air-to-water coil in an air handler if it was really big. Uh, so there's these two V-bank coils. And then atop this, you can't see it here, but there's at the Vita system in Albany, there's 18 adiabatic, I'm sorry, 18 ECM motors, each one compartmentalized, and we have two of these big guys that are about the size of a boxcar there, and they're sitting outside, and then most of the time they're just running dry. In fact, during the STCP demonstration, they ran dry the entire time. Uh, at Fort Benning, smaller 35-ton system, these adiabatic dry coolers have about six fans on there, and, um, and um, the pads, uh, if you come over here, if you're from Georgia, you see these all over the place. Uh, they're on the inlet side of a chicken house. So in a chicken house, in most places, you can't afford the chicken if they air condition them. So we evaporate water through these pads, uh, so-called swamp cooling sometimes, evaporative cooling, or if you're a geek, uh, adiabatic cooling. We cool that outside air uh, adiabatically, and the air is still uh, it's pretty saturated, but it's not wet. And then the air, after passing through the coil, then I'm sorry, through the evaporative pad, strikes the coil and then is carried up and out. So uh, that's an adiabatic dry cooler. There's a lot of ways to do it. We don't like spraying water on the coils and calcium and all that precipitating out. But since under ESTCP, our goal, our demonstration plan was 80 to 100% reduction, we ran these guys bone dry for that first year and the data you'll see in just a moment. But we intend in the coming year, Albany has uh, good pricing on water and, and uh, Fort Benning also, we, we intend tend uh, probably to run these wet to slide the energy water nexus bar, I'll show you in a minute, uh, over a bit to, to make that work out. So nice piece of technology with 18 fans, two dry coolers, 15% minimum speed on the ECMs. We can do a, have a 361 turndown, which is incredible. Uh, so we can slow these things around. They're typically lopping along slow at night. We never run the fans any faster than 50%. And just to kind of give you a comparison about something no one ever talks about, COP of heat rejection. What does that even mean? How many kilowatt hours do I have to spend to dump a kilowatt hour into the air? Typically, your air conditioning unit sitting outside your house, heat pump, cooling only, four tons. You're going to have to you're going to have to spend about a kilowatt hour to dump a hundred into the atmosphere in the summertime, 95 degrees outside. With these systems running in the wintertime and the cold air and slowing the fans way down, we could hit as high as a COP of 1,600, but that's not normal. Over the course of a winter, we're basically telling you that we can dump the heat in the winter two to three times more efficient than you could in the summer when it was really hot. So kind of a neat little, this doesn't have anything to do with the compressor. This doesn't have anything to do with the overall COP. This is really just referring to the um, COP of heat rejection. So obviously, when it's cold outside, you can reject heat more efficiently uh, than you than you could 
uh, in the summertime. And, and also you can do it without evaporating water. Evaporating water is kind of a crutch we engineers lean on so we can get 85 degree heat sink instead of a 95 or 100. And it's not a bad crutch if you got plenty of water. And I'm not, a, I'm not against evaporative cooling, but uh, we do have a guest from us from South Africa. And very interestingly, the uh, Green Star program they adopted instead of LEED, uh, they penalize you if you use water to evaporatively cool. And so, um, you know, that's starting to get more attention here in the U.S., but in the projects we've done in South Africa, obviously the water there is is is, is pretty critical. And so uh, they do recognize that evaporative cooling in and of itself has an environmental impact. All right, so the schematic of the BETA system is, is similar. This is just really an illustration. It isn't meant to be a rigorous engineering drawing. But as you see the red pipe coming up out of the ground, think of its 70-degree uh, formation. We've warmed the water up to maybe 65 degrees or so. It goes into the building. The heat pumps uh, pull heat out of the loop and, uh, and heat the building. Uh, so this would be what happens in Albany with a water-to-water -water heat pump. Uh, then the water is cooled by the building, our so-called waste cool again. And then we go through the plate and frame and the dry cool and cool it down even further. And then the kind of fuzzy uh, uh, bluish out into the yellowish is, is representing we're extracting heat out of the formation. So that's our beta system that's trying to make cold. All heat pumps, all geothermal heat pump systems do this. They, they chill the formation in the winter and they warm the formation in the summer. And if it's like my house, generally those two balance one another. There's not a whole lot going on in the fall and the spring. Houses are a whole different ball game than, than commercial buildings. Commercial buildings are cooling year-round. Uh, if you read our final reports, you'll see the cooling to heating ratio in both of these jobs is something around 10 to 1. So we have a whole lot more cooling need on an annual basis than we do. Uh, further north, that gets closer to balance. And, you know, maybe in Alaska, uh, you, you, you get to cooling dominated in a commercial building. But you have a well-insulated building, good glass, good insulation, and you throw people and computers and lights in there. It's getting better because the LED lights, for example, don't put off so much heat. But most commercial buildings, independent of their geographic location, on an annual basis tend to be cooling dominated. And there are certainly exceptions to that. All right, so this is uh, Big Brother Google flying the satellite over. Uh, Albany uh, during the construction phase. The white rectangle in the bottom represents the log com where the, uh, uh, I think I said it was three star, the two star I believe in there, and 800 employees are in this three story building. And uh, pipe is run uh, kind of up the sheet there and over to the left. Uh, the two mountains there, um, uh, that's the uh, Tim Tetro Mountain 1 and 2. There, that is where we've removed the earth from the beetus. So unlike traditional geothermal where we're digging a lot of trenches, we just take four feet of earth out and set it over to the side, much like you were making a uh, catfish pond. And uh, if you look really hard, you can see where the aliens came down and wrote hieroglyphics in the beetus there. You can see kind of some little uh, scribbling marks. So that was where the aliens came down uh, for a little while and then left. And in to that circle there, we drilled uh, 200 feet, 210 feet down, 306 times. So that is our beatus. It's circular in shape, uh, and uh, these fingers go down into the limestone and the groundwater there to, so that we can access the geology as a heat sink and heat source. When we finished, uh, we put the dirt back over there, paved it over, and you saw the trees that were pretty green in the upper left corner are now brown and destroyed where the tornado came across here. So the little blue and white Rectangles, if you can see them, were the dry coolers before they were placed, and they had shrink wrap on top of them. But that's just a kind of a good aerial view of the uh, system. And this is not actually a blue-eyed person with, uh, with uh, you know, red eyes around the perimeter. This is an illustration of the beetus. So the water mains come up from the right, and uh, they pass by the dry coolers and the reversing valves and then into the bore field. So in the example of charging, the water flows through the blue mains around the kind of hexagonal uh, inner header through into 102 boreholes in the middle, out of those 102 into another 102 boreholes in the green zone, and then finally the red zone. So cold in the middle, charging warm water heading back to the building to either heat the building or be dumped to atmosphere through the dry coolers. In the, in the summertime, uh, warm water flows to the perimeter. Those boreholes on the perimeter are great because they're exposed to infinity. Uh, so they have, a good, uh, they have a good factor there for uh, so-called G factor, but the uh, factor of uh, they have a good ability to dissipate heat. And then as they work their way to the in, inner sanctum there, the cold water gets colder and back to the building. So that's kind of a plan view of the Betus at Albany with its uh, 
306 boreholes. And just grabbing, so if you do the high-level math there, 306 divided by three boreholes in series is 102. So there are 102 of these uh, radial subheaders. So in this illustration, in the left side, the red water is summertime, warm water coming in to the outer boreholes that do a better job of dissipating heat than the inner boreholes because we don't want to store the heat. They pass through the geology in the middle, cooling it further, and then the last borehole cooling it even further, nice cold water heading back to the building. When we reverse it in the wintertime, the water's flowing in the blue main, chilling the core down, then the intermediate, then the outer, and back to the building. So that's kind of the, one of the sub-circuits there and what it looks like. What were our goals under ESTCP? 30% uh, reduction of the energy consumption by the HVAC system, be it gas or electrons. Uh, we wanted to beat conventional GHP uh, by... Um, 10%, but we also wanted to reduce the uh, cost of the GHP system, as you'll see in some of those other parameters, and, uh, and then in increase energy security and, and reduce water consumption and maintenance. So how did we do? I know it's a little hard to read, but you can get the printout and see it if you want. 30%, we hit 47.5% uh, on the BETIS. ATIS 52.7. Uh, Just a note here, the reason it says the word model, the BETIS was constructed uh, about two, two years ago, been running for about two years. The ATIS system has just been uh, finished up. Uh, uh, Fort Benning did part of the project uh, inside the building. We did the ATIS system outside the building. Its first uh, full year of operation uh, starts now and, and goes through next year. So we are planning to uh, continue to monitor that so we can uh, maybe update this report one day and get rid of that word model. But in general, you see we we have measured and modeled, and the, the BETIS modeling was very close to the uh, to the measured, uh, around 50%. Uh, we think we can even better that with some tweaking that we're hoping to do this year after we're out of under uh, the gun of the demonstration project. We, we think there's some more savings to be gained there. Um, we also wanted to beat a traditional GHP system by uh, by 10%. And, and listen, you can put more or less boreholes in there, and you can you can change this savings over traditional GO versus capital costs. It's kind of a slider bar there. You can move back and forth. But we were glad we we beat conventional uh, GO by 15% uh, on the beta system there. And we ate us. We uh, our cost estimates indicate it was around 15% too. But if you couple that with the next thing, if you drop all the way down to the second to the last row, you'll see a 33.6 reduction in capital costs. So we think that's pretty cool to be able to reduce the construction costs by 34% over traditional ground loop uh, and also uh, reduce the energy consumption. And, and be aware that when you're in a deep south climate like we are or even a very cold climate, anywhere where the loads aren't balanced, you have to, if you do it right and you want the system to last for 30 years and all you're doing in the long run is putting more heat in the ground than you're taking out, it's going to warm up. So there are plenty of systems out there that screw up, but it's only because they weren't engineered properly and they weren't modeled properly and they put more heat in the ground or took more heat out of the ground than the, than the system could could stand. But the science is pretty settled on this. If you do it right, uh, you, you, these systems can last a long time. But as you can imagine, if you put, in the example of us, more heat in the ground than you take out long term, guess what? The ground's going to warm up. The water's going to warm up. All this hard work you did of getting a high efficiency on the front end is going to fade. With BETIS or ATIS and these auxiliary heat rejection devices, our goal is for the efficiency to get better each year, to actually take more heat out of the ground than we're dumping in there so we can get lower, uh, as an example, condenser water. So anyway, looking at each of these metrics, uh, we, we hit the first two. The third one, we, we hit it because we didn't use any water uh, versus uh, the BETIS system was consuming about, I think it was 4.7 million gallons a year. People are focused on no flush toilets and low flow shower heads and all that other other stuff, but if there's a cooling tower out back, go meter it. That's where your water consumption is, is at the cooling tower. So we were proud to hit 100% on that. We got rid of the gas boilers. Uh, we didn't need any auxiliary heat to keep the system going. So um, we, were, we were glad to uh, be able to eliminate the on-site emissions, uh, get it off of the base there, and then uh, install cost, as we said there. Uh, only thing we didn't hit was carbon reduction, but that was my fault because I got, I got too uh, ambitious with the 40% reduction. Georgia, we burn a lot of coal, some other things, uh, switching from gas to electricity in a coal plant and all of that. Uh, but you, you can easily hit the 40% depending on your mix of, of power and, and so forth. 
All right, so how, how did we achieve these systems? Well, just like a traditional a geothermal heat pump, we had a superior heat sink and a superior heat source. Uh, but what added, layered on top of that, the UDIS systems of BETIS and ATIS both uh, give us deliberately stratified cold storage. They give us reversibility. Uh, they give us uh, a need for less pipe in the ground if, if we can balance the load and deliberately store the cold. And that is what helped us achieve these savings. The complementary technologies I want to talk about, if uh, we have time, it looks like I've still got a little bit of time, is uh, heat recovery. We've hit on that a little bit already. The, the, these are the, uh, this is the uh, six-pipe water-to-water heat pump where we're connected to the ground, the beat us, uh, but we're also connected to chill water and hot water. And honestly, a lot of the time in the winter, we're just taking the heat, uh, out of the cooling, the chill water coils on the air handler. It's going out to the building. Normally, it goes through a true reheat VAV box with gas being burned and hot water heat, reheating that water back up. We're just taking free heat off of the compressors, feeding it to the VAV boxes at low heat, 105 degrees, say, and we're reheating the air for free, if you will. And so that was a really good technology, the heat recovery uh, heat pumps. Now, the, the thing you've got to watch is the heat recovery load, the, the cooling load, and the heating load never never balance. And, and the heat pump doesn't care. It can really do one or the other, but it can't do both. And so we, we had 10 steps of capacity control because we had five modules, each with two independent refrigeration units. We may even retrofit uh, the, these units at, at Albany, one of the compressors with a VFD on there so we can tune it to exactly the load. But the BETIS, the ground loop, is what gives you some thermal mass so that maybe you're not banging these systems on and off so, so quickly. So anyway, a little tr few Tricks there you got to be careful on, but heat recovery uh, is a technology I really like. Adiabatic dry coolers, I've kind of beat that to death, but they're more expensive than cooling towers. It'll always be cheaper to stick a metal box out there and then to uh, take the metal box and drip water down through, uh, not hydro scopic but hydrophilic pvc fill and but you, you use a you, you know you use a pound of water for every um, uh, 1050 btus you got to dissipate so adiabatic dry coolers are more money but it allows you to have a device that's much more optimized for sensible heat transfer and when needed can work in the evaporative cooling mode and distributive temperature sensing something i'm really excited about and i'm going to hit here in just a moment if there's time all right, so was I telling the truth that we did the cold in the middle where we cared and then the middle less and, uh, uh, and, and less for the outer boreholes? Well, it turns out physics does actually work, and, uh, and the heat transfer is, is universal, and the teal line there, the deep, the deep dips you see, that is with us having instruments on a, a representative sub-main of three boreholes. And as you can see, left scale is, is degrees Fahrenheit. We're taking somewhere between what, maybe a 12 degree and a 15 degree delta T across the inner borehole. So in this case, we're sending it really cold water in the winter. And sure enough, our borehole is taking the hit, taking the 15 degree rise. We're warming up the water 15 degrees or we're chilling the formation, if you will. Then with less delta T available, less LMTD here between the ground and the water, our middle borehole gives us, you know, what do you see there on the green line, maybe a 5 to 6, 7 degree delta T. And then the outer borehole, yes, we're only getting a 2 to 3 get delta T, but in the military analogy here, there is an infinite uh, regiment of soldiers st surrounding this beat us, all at 70 degrees, trying to come forward and destroy all our efforts to make cold. So we don't want to give them attractive targets at the perimeter there. So we're only going to let that perimeter be a couple of degrees colder. But the neat part is when you add up the 15 degree delta T plus the 6 degree delta T, you're at 21, a couple more, maybe you're getting a 23 degree delta T. So as many of you know, low GPM, high delta T leads to low pump energy consumption. So you got to do the right thing on the inside of the building. But if you go to an average geothermal system with all the piping in parallel, uh, you'll typically see maybe a 6, 8 degree drop. So we're maybe doubling or tripling that to try to save some energy. So we did truly do the work at the core where we wanted it to be done. And then we weren't really certain this was going to happen, but we ended up with uh, diurnal storage, which we should know that. It gets cold at night uh, and it's warmer during the day. So in this illustration, the green line, and I'm going to grab this evil pointer here, forgive me, but this green line represents the entering water. So we're making colder and colder and colder, and that particular night we got down to maybe 53 degree water. And then the sun came up and the dry cooler couldn't do its work, and it shot up, shot up, shot up, and then boom, right here the control said, forgive 
forget it. They cried, Uncle, we can't make cold anymore. we got to start dumping heat to you. So now the flow reverses, and this is the inlet water, the blue line. Before the blue line was the outlet water. Now it's the inlet water. So now we're dumping heat in. We didn't get any hotter in about 72 degrees and back down again. And now we flip again. So the, light, the dark blue represents the thermal cold storage we did that night. The red represents the amount we harvested during the day. Blue, back to storage again. Hot day the next day. That night didn't get cold enough. Sorry, we had to stay basically in the discharging mode. But it was a moderate day. And so area under the red curve you know, went on for a day or two, or day really roughly, and then back into cold storage. So th this, this represents a, a diurnal uh, storage event. Um, during uh, a, a shoulder season. Now this is uh, January of 2015. Uh, we're we're making cold all night long, all day long. So from the 6th through the 15th, nine days, we did pure cold storage. And as you can see, we got the dang water down to 40 degrees heading out to the beta. So we can chill that 7 degree limestone pretty good with 40 degree water. So and as you can kind of see also on the blue line is it is falling in time. So as the winter is going on, you know we could originally only give 70 degree water. Now we're getting periods there where we may be given 65 degree water. So that worked out well. Uh, this is uh, back in the fall. Uh, we're, we're dumping heat all the time. So water's coming in and out 75, 85 degrees, coming back in the low 70s. That's dumping heat into the betas. These are the reversing valves, uh, really just a couple of uh, three-way valves, uh, like you'd see on any chill hot water system, allows us to route the water in and out of the core, depending on where charging and discharging. You can see the uh, adiabatic dry coolers in the background. Uh, I claimed less GHX needed, so kind of under the technology transfer slide, you see three drawings at Albany here, BDAS 2, 3, and 4, we're calling it. The black lines underneath represent the traditional parallel flow, you know, three, four, five mains. The red circles represent the actual BDAS that we put in. Uh, so obviously you use less land with the BDAS than we did with a conventional closed loop system with no cooling tower where we're trying to dump heat all the time and dissipate it, you know, without the benefit of an adiabatic dry cooler, without the benefit of the ATIS. And so we need more land to, to dissipate dissipate all that heat. Uh, the color slides in the bottom right corner represent the VA. Uh, this is up at the very top of the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, they have a facility there at Perry Point, Maryland. We had to squeeze in the betas between the river and the hospital there in the buildings. So we had to ovalize it, if you will, the bottom right corner. I know it's a little hard to see, but that represents uh, an oval betas with uh, several um, at the core of the bore field. We, in that case, we had some vaults and then perimeter vaults also. So that's a technology transfer of betas two, three, four, and five happened uh, during the ESTCB demonstration project. The Marines liked what they saw. They ordered to convert three other jobs to that, and then the VA uh, engineers we were working for there were interested in it too. So a couple of complementary technologies here. I've, I've hit the first two very hard, and I'm going to take the last minute or so here to uh, hit the uh, last one. DTS, fascinating technology. We kind of, we didn't discover it, but we were made aware of it during the process. Uh, oil and gas industry use this a pretty good bit. Uh, sometimes if they drill wells out in the ocean, uh, they don't uh, do everything they should sometimes, but if they had run DTS fiber all the way down a well, you, you could see when the oil is starting to breach and, and come up. It's usually pretty warm. So oil and gas technology that has applications everywhere. Um, one of our guests that's joining us today Today from Sweden is an expert in this, but uh, DTS operates on two primary principles, optical time domain reflectometry and optical frequency domain reflectometry, which basically means the speed of light is a constant, and then, the, and then it also, all atoms vibrate at a certain frequency when they're above absolute zero. So we shoot a beam of light down this fiber, it strikes the wall of the uh, uh, of the fiber and then it tries to uh, bounce back or it does bounce back and we time how long it took that light pulse to come back and we also look at the frequency shift and we can literally know the temperature of the glass fiber which in this case is fiber inside that black pipe down to 225 feet. Uh, maybe a little hard to read that graph but we don't need temperatures but every hour or so we had roughly 2600 meters of uh, fiber in the ground which allowed us to get 1300 independent temperatures temperature points with an accuracy to a few hundredths of a degree centigrade. We didn't need more than a tenth, but this is uh, 
kind of one of the lower end systems and yet it was all we needed. So really fascinated by this technology. It can be laid down a riverbed to know if a river is infiltrating or exfiltrating. It can be known if salmon are going to spawn at that temperature. You can wrap it around a turbine to know hundreds of temperature points around the turbine if you've got a hot spot. Uh, you can run it throughout a hangar to know uh, temperatures if there's a fire, know exactly where the fire is. So DTS, pretty cool technology to me. Uh, we were able to incorporate that in this project. Uh, in the upper left corner is the betus. The curvy lines represent the fiber that we weaved in and out of nine wells. And then we also um, uh, uh, carried it back to the building so we could monitor the system. We also put some of this fiber down a hole where we do a thermal conductivity test, and it allowed us to measure the thermal conductivity layer by layer. So I won't get into exactly, th this slide represents the temperatures in the U-bend as we tested it. But the bottom line is that uh, DTS used in conjunction with a traditional thermal conductivity test will allow you to know the K values of the conductivity layer by layer by layer to kind of optimize the depth of a borehole. It's kind of like getting six or ten thermal conductivity tests for every one you do. So neat technology. Uh, do we have time, Ruler, for the video? I think we should skip it. And okay. there's a link All right. for it right here. Uh, you guys will have a link here. You can watch it at any time. The three slides there illustrating the heat we pumped down in the upper left corner during the thermal conductivity test. Uh, the second slide representing that heat flowing out into the bore field. And the last slide, an illustration when the system is actually operating the cold at the core of the bore field and then the heat kind of at the perimeter. So uh, feel free to look at that uh, online uh, later. And uh, Anyway, bottom line, uh, we think we demonstrated that we could increase energy efficiency while increasing energy security and HVAC reli reliability. Technology transfer could be done in months, not years. We literally do have a slider bar that's kind of the energy water nexus that allows us to uh, decide if we're going to use water or kilowatt hours. Overall, BETIS is a 50-state technology. It can be used anywhere. Uh, ATIS, you do have to have a good aquifer, but it does have all the promise of even higher efficiencies. And direct ATIS, the holy grail, where we store uh, chill water directly in the ground, maybe the northern third of the U.S., and we don't even run the compressor during the cooling mode. Only running the compressors in the winter for heat allows us to have a potential reduction uh, of maybe 85% if we're not running uh, uh, the compressor. So we think that's a great future opportunity, and I certainly think DTS has a lot of applications in the U.S. that it's not even being considered for. So in the end, if you want to achieve these goals that you see here in, in blue, uh, including some professional goals, we would encourage you to try to consider one of these more state-of-the-art systems. Uh, it's a better way of doing geothermal heat pumps, in our opinion. Uh, with this successful demonstration, we think you could consider this at your facility uh, because it has now been proven in the United States. It's been proven around the world for quite a while, but we've got a couple of systems right here in the good old USA working, and we think it's a, it's a great opportunity. So uh, our final report is now posted. I want to warn you, it's maybe 800 pages long, including the appendix. The body is maybe 120, but a lot of information there. Feel free to look at the video, and this presentation itself will be online uh, in semi-perpetuity. So that's the end of my presentation. Great. Thank you so much, Chuck. We have a lot of questions for you. The first one is from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in Memphis. Um, what drove the decision to use a hydraulic check valve controller versus an electric controller? Uh, good question. We looked at uh, several injection valves. Um, uh, you know, obviously with a submersible pump down hole, we've got a, a fairly uh, sophisticated device down there that is submerged underwater. But that that technology of submersible pumps is is pretty pretty solid. Uh, been around for decades. Uh, don't have a big fear of putting a pump down that deep in the ground. It's done millions of times, uh, I would say, uh, around the world. Uh, the valve obviously could be electric or hydraulic. All the valve manufacturers that we looked at all use hydraulic. Some use compressed air. Most of them use uh, distilled water or maybe a food grade oil. Uh, we didn't see an electric actuated valve. Things are very tight down in that hole because wells are expensive. So um, we liked having the controller 
and the, 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 the complicated stuff up at the surface, running two simple tubes uh, down the line strapped to the to the drop pipe just like the power wiring and uh, this particular valve I'm, I'm really excited about it's uh, it's a uh, uh, with the distilled water in the valve of all the designs we looked at uh, it seemed to be the most solid one and um, the company is an American company uh, that uh, that uh, owns the the valve but they also have a, a European um, uh, facility where they manufacture them so a very, very high quality valve in our opinion, solid stainless steel, not a lot of moving parts, a couple of seals, and I, I think it will last longer than an electric actuated valve, in my opinion. Thank you. And here's a question from Shell. Did your pilot studies look at potential effects on groundwater quality due to the heating and cooling? Um, not directly, but I, I will tell you anecdotally something that's very interesting. Um, in Europe, these ATIS systems are encouraged highly where they have contaminated um, sites. So th there is a, a city in Europe, and I'd have to look it up if you want to know, send me an email and I'll get you the information. But they had a dry cleaning uh, system. The chemicals from dry cleaning ended up in the groundwater, contaminated the aquifer, put in an ATIS system for air conditioning purposes, and to their surprise, it attenuated the movement of the water back and forth, back and forth, temperature change attenuated the contaminants. So these systems are actually used elsewhere to clean up a dirty site. Um, to give you a little bit of a comfort level, if you took all the activities of mankind and we shut down these computers we're on right now and the lights and the air conditioning systems and we just stuck electric resistance heat in the ground. Uh, and that's all mankind did. We lived in the dark ages and we pumped all the energy, nuclear, solar, all of it, hydro, all of it, in the ground, it would equal roughly to 1% of the natural solar radiation that falls on the Earth. So we don't see a big long-term, uh, we, we don't see an issue with using the ground as a heat sink source. In the end, uh, as, as I learned even at Little Auburn University, uh, heat flows from hot to cold, and the core of the Earth is hot, and space is cold. So in the end, all the air, all the heat transfers to outer space. The ground, the area where we use, 25 to 500 feet is essentially worldwide within about three degrees of the average ambient air temperature. So over millions of years, that thin layer there uh, equilibrates to the air temperature. If you put too much heat in a particular zone and you don't pull it out, yes, the loop can get hot, the air conditioning doesn't work. But we don't see environmental impacts as a negative thing. In fact, as EPA said literally like 30 years ago, and I can get the quote too, uh, they said geothermal heat pumps are the most efficient technology out there. To me, you're damaging the environment more by crutching on the air as your heat sink source. And the problem with the air is in the winter it's cold. And the problem with the air is in the summer it's hot. The ground doesn't change. So the air is a really crappy heat sink in the summer and a crappy heat source in the winter. So we think it's the most environmentally friendly way to do things. Doesn't mean you don't want to grout these boreholes. It doesn't mean you got to make sure you don't get sur surface contaminants. It doesn't mean you don't have to do things carefully. But in the end, we, we think it's the most environmentally friendly technology that you can heat and cool a building with. Thank you, Chuck. Uh, a question from the NASA Research Center. Um, are traditional geothermal wells designed to prevent unintended exchange and losses to the proximate ground as distinct from uh, BTAS? Um, let me make sure I get the nuance of that question. Read it one more time, please. Are traditional geothermal wells designed to prevent unintended exchange and losses to the proximate ground as distinct from BTAS? Compare uh, no. geothermal wells to BTAS wells. Okay, all right. I'll make a couple of distinctions. Uh, unless you're in the environmental uh, world, you don't make distinctions, but we'll call, if we're taking liquid water in and out of the ground, we'll call that a well. If we're just drilling a hole in the ground, sticking plastic pipe in there, and then grouting it up, we'll call that a borehole. So I think this question is referring to, to boreholes. The boreholes, uh, there are some exotic coaxial heat exchangers and so forth, uh, but we just used uh, the, the traditional 
high density polyethylene U bin, which is a, typically in this case inch and a quarter pipe. This is at the beta system. It goes down in the ground, makes a U-turn at the bottom, comes back out the top. You pump grout into there. They, those fingers, those boreholes, those heat conductive heat devices they are identical essentially whether you're doing betas or traditional ground loop so the, the fingers the, the the devices you're using to access the geology for conductive heat transfer are identical whether you're conventional geo or or betas so it it there is no difference and they're all trying to get the heat in and out of the formation as quickly as you can so some people are rifling the interior of the plastic to try to increase it. Uh, in, in the case of Albany, uh, in the, in, with its Betas project, we wanted to get the highest heat transfer that we could afford. So instead of using sand, which is normally a thermal enhancement element to go in with the bentonite, uh, we actually use graphite. Um, it makes it a lower density that doesn't leak out into the limestone so bad, uh, so quickly, uh, and it higher conductivity. So we did use graphite, but graphite is used nowadays. It's, it's kind of coming into its own as an alternate thermal enhancement element. So in the end, you want the most possible heat transfer at the borehole because it gives you the tightest approach to the ground temperature. But in the end, the key factor is what is the conductivity of the formation. It's great to have a Ferrari there to get the heat in and out, but in the end, the formation is really where all the work gets done. And interestingly, we don't know yet, but with traditional geothermal systems, you want the highest conductivity you can get. In my career, the highest I've ever seen in English units is maybe around 2.2 uh, BTUs per degree Fahrenheit uh, uh, per square foot or per foot, sorry. Uh, that would typically be in granite. Sand, if it's really dry, might be bad at 0.6. Sand, if it's wet, uh, might be uh, in, the, in the magnitude of one to one and a half. So almost all geothermal projects are in a formation with a conductivity typically between maybe 0.8. Uh, I think Dr. Spittler is on the line here. He might can uh, update us with the real numbers, but maybe between 0.8 and 2 covers the vast majority of the jobs. And in the end, that is really what determines how quickly heat moves in and out. And interestingly with V, us, we don't know that we necessarily want a super high K value. It's great in the betas because we can get the heat in and out of the formation, but we might lose it to the perimeter. So in the end, earth, dirt, straw, all of that is, um, I'm not straw, sorry, earth, dirt, sand, limestone, rock, all of that is not really an insulator. It's not really a, a a, a conductor, as, as I said, really good formation uh, with granite would have a K value of 2. Copper has a K value of 200. So when engineers are trying to do true heat transfer, they're using copper, aluminum, those kind of things. They wouldn't normally use the ground. But on the other hand, when we're trying to insulate polyisosanurate, styrofoam, that stuff is radically more insulating than the ground. So the ground is somewhere in between an insulator and a conductor, but I view it as thermal mass. I, the, the tremendous amount of thermal mass that we have there for free if we can just access it by either pulling the water in and out or putting these uh, ground loops down in there. So I, I see it as kind of a, a, a thermal mass situation. But, but in the end, the boreholes are the same. Thank you, Chuck. Um, what are the main cost factors that make BTEF systems less expensive than traditional ground loop design? Um, the, the first thing is that beta systems are always active. So we're not just sticking these passive boreholes down in the ground, hoping the uh, energy will match in and out, and the system will stay uh, uniform in temperature over time. That's just not reality. Uh, th there is some argument within the community of geothermal heat pump uh, uh, nerds like myself, you know, how much the ground heats up and all of that, but the physics are pretty straightforward. You know, if you pump more heat in the ground than you take out, over the long term, the ground's going to warm up. So, um, you know, the, the first good thing about a beta system is, in my opinion, they're always active. You are actively managing the ground. So if you're in a cold climate, you're making sure you put enough heat in the ground typically free heat from a thermal uh, resource like a thermal uh, solar collector. Uh, or in our case, uh, we're dumping heat in the wintertime to, to, to make cold. So 
the first thing about Betus over traditional closed loop geo with no cooling tower, if you have a cooling tower or a dry cooler or something there, it's sometimes called a hybrid system because it's a hybrid of traditional heat transfer and the ground. If you're in a really cold climate, the hybrid might be a supplemental boiler. You put enough pipe in the ground to do the cooling uh, in the summertime, but there's really not enough pipe in the ground to, to heat the building fully. So the, you kind of use this boiler for peak shaving, use this cooling tower for, for peak heat dump at, at peak season. And so, um, you know, the first thing about Betus is it's actively managed. The second thing is, to me, the heat exchanger is more efficient. Those boreholes on the perimeter are great for dissipating heat or cold because they have an infinite exposure to the perimeter, but they're not so good for capturing heat or cold. Those core boreholes are great because they're surrounded by soldiers. I mean, they've got, you know, they've got 10 battalions around them protecting them, and then the general's sitting in the middle. So, so they're very protected from the, from the geology in general. So those are important boreholes, and BETUS allows you to differentiate between those two. Instead of running the pipes out there and just hitting them all in parallel and treating them all the same, and they're not the same. If you actually instrument them, you'll see that the core, if you're dumping heat, more heat in the ground you take out, you'll see the core boreholes get hotter than the perimeter boreholes. You'll see the perimeter boreholes are doing more work than the middle boreholes. And it would be great to shunt the water to the perimeter, but you can't do it, and you certainly can't reverse the flow. So in the end, it's reversibility, it's actively controlled, and it's a more efficient heat exchanger to me when you can differentiate between exterior and interior boreholes. I'm sorry my answers are so short. <laughs> well, thank you, Chuck. You've done a great job of answering all our questions. And at this point, we are going to go ahead and wrap up. Um, I'd like to remind all of you that our next webinar is on Thursday, June 29th. And it will be on future vulnerabilities to Alaskan ecosystems and tools for permafrost assessment. This webinar will feature two speakers, Dr. Michelle Max from Northern Arizona University and Mr. Kevin Beheya from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Registration is already open for this webinar, so please visit the CERTIP and ESCCP webinar webpage to register for this and other webinars. Before we conclude, I would like to remind you that both the audio and a copy of the presentation of today's session will be archived on our webinar webpage in case you would like to refer to them in the future. We would appreciate it if you can please take a moment from your busy day to complete the survey that will pop up on your screen at this time. This concludes today's webcast. Thank you. <laughs>